That's a right and godly crying people. You know. Um, Every so often, uh, people ask me a question. I was asked it again this week. Um, why isn't everybody set free to exactly this, the same measure? Um, and my answer is always, I don't have what I would call a guaranteed response to that. But one of the things that I believe is this. Whenever the Lord called me to this ministry back in 1991, he gave me a verse of scripture from Exodus, and that would be at the bottom of our notepaper. And it was then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and go stand before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh stands for Satan, Egypt stands for the world, etc. I explained a little bit about that last week. Go stand before Pharaoh and say, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. Not just let my people go, but let my people go that they may serve me. And so I, I think, I, I don't know this, but I, I suspect from years and years and years of doing this, that a lot of people want to be set free from these things, not that they might serve the Lord better and more gloriously, but that just life would be more comfortable, that there would have less hassle. You know, that it would just make life easier. Uh, and graciously, God often does that. But I think that the real results come from people who just have a burning heart to serve Jesus. Just to be a prophet to the nation. Just to be a living letter to their family, to their neighbours, to their workmates, to, to everybody... But they just know that they're not in that place that they want to be. And that this burning desire that they would be more Christ-like. Lord, get rid of these terrible fears. Get rid of this irrational anger. Get rid of this rejection that makes me behave that way. Lord, get rid of it that I might reveal more of you. I think that I think that, that seems to produce much more fruit. For understandable reasons. Let my people go that they may serve me. Uh, and that is my heart that I just have a real zeal for the house of God. A real zeal to see to see Jesus revealed through his people. Because this is the body of Christ. And therefore if this is the body of Christ then people ought to see Christ in his people. And I'm not convinced that if you went out on a Saturday into a busy street and questioned a hundred people, I'm not sure what the answers would be. So the problem is never with Jesus. The problem is always with us. And so I always have a desire to do more and to be better. And so my prayers would be, Lord, please get rid of this that I might reveal more of you. Not get rid of this that my life would be less hassle or more comfortable. Um, I just put that before you because I think when there's a real hunger for righteousness, when there's a real thirst, then, then I really believe that, that, that God needs that. Anyway, on this last of these weeks, we're going to talk about anger. And I would say if a person has never, ever experienced the emotion of anger, then there is something wrong with you. That maybe you have that you're much too passive, much too, I almost say, broken if you've never experienced anger. Because anger is something that actually comes with, with the package. We are made in the image of God, not made in the image of a monkey, not made even in the image of Michael the Archangel, but we're made in the very image of God. And as we go through the Bible, we see that one of the very powerful emotions expressed by God throughout His Word is anger. Now, the Bible makes it quite clear that God is slow to anger. Very long-suffering. But you actually see the cases where he, where he is uh, angry. For instance, if somebody, uh, in I think it's Exodus 21, 21 from memory, I, I don't have that in my notes, but I'm pretty sure that's one example of the verses, where he says that if you touch the orphans, 
for the widows or the fatherless, if you hurt them, you have me to deal with. You know, it's a righteous anger. Or there's times when maybe he uh, just dealt so wonderfully and graciously with the children of Israel, and after a while, off they are again, worshipping idols, offering their, their uh, children up to pagan gods. And he sends prophet after prophet to tell them to turn back, and they stone the prophets. And eventually you see the righteous anger of God being produced. And again, 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 you will see that anger is an emotion. But that is a righteous anger. And so, Jesus obviously said he only did what he saw the Father doing, only you know, saying what he heard the Father saying. And we see, for instance, that time when he went into the temple and there was people making money out of it. It might have seemed harmless to us because people were would sacrifice dogs and pigeons. So these men were in selling pigeons and dogs for a couple of coins. So it, it could have been seen maybe as just a, a service to help the, the worshippers. But Jesus came in and he was he obviously felt from his father this righteous anger that the house that this house of God was being turned into a merchandising place. And Jesus, it was a righteous anger because he went away and made a whip of cords. So it wasn't that he exploded with anger. It says that he made a whip of cords. Well, if I said, Michael, away and make me a whip of cords, he wouldn't do it in 10 seconds. He would take quite some action to get the stick, the cords, tie it all together, get knots, test it out, and then come back. But then there was this righteous anger when he overturns the tables and says, Get out, get out. Get out, you, you know, you're turning my father's house, which should be a house of prayer, and a house of merchandise. But then I love the part, then he's outside, uh, outside the temple then, healing the people, etc. And of course, the religious Pharisees of the day, who were always putting big legalistic burdens on the people, but wouldn't lift a, a finger to help them, is that Jesus was always under attack from, from the Pharisees who believed they were guarding the kingdom of God. And you see a righteous anger there. You root of vipers, you whitewash tombs, you hypocrites. And there you see Jesus being so gentle that the sinners loved him. They followed him up the mountainside. Everywhere he came on the shore, there they were awaiting for him. But the Pharisees and those people who were trying to, to turn the, the house of God and uh, just bring the world into it, you saw a righteous anger. And so... As that is part of the makeup of God, it should not be a surprise that built within us is the ability to have anger. Now, I always say the secret of the Christian life is Christ within us. I was talking last, last week on fear. And <laughs> no matter what happens, Jesus Christ within me isn't, isn't frightened. No matter what comes against him. So if I get frightened, if... Christ in me isn't frightened and I'm frightened. I start moving out of alignment with, with Christ in me. And likewise, you know, occasionally there's certain things that I would see happening in the body of Christ which are just, it just shouldn't be. And there's times I, got, I have felt a righteous anger, a real righteous anger. Let me give you, let me give you an example of that. When I was first uh, a young Christian and uh, um, uh, I had been attending a, a small church, uh, I won't name the denomination because that doesn't glorify anybody, but it was, a, it was a, a new plant building and it was shared between two denominations. And so one denomination met on a Sunday morning and the other on a, on a Sunday night and they alternated that and it seemed to work fine. Anyway, I uh, I helped to run a youth club there every Friday night. It was a youth club, not a church one. It was from all the the lads and girls from around the estate, all totally unsaved. But for about a year and a half, I kind of helped to run that um, and to tell them about Jesus. It was a, a rough old ride for 18 months. They were a rough bunch, but but you know, I really, really enjoyed it. And I looked forward to the Friday nights. But one Friday night, I, I came along and saw there was stalls up and there was lots and lots of books 
thousands of books put out in stalls and I said, oh, what's happening here? They said, oh, sorry, we forgot to tell you that there's a book sale tomorrow to raise money for the church. And uh, we forgot to tell you that the youth club wasn't on. So, of course, all the lads and girls were turning up and had to stand there and say, I'm sorry, it's not on. But okay, no big deal. But I'm somebody that really has had a love for books and always had hundreds of times, thousands of books in the, in the house until we have to unload a lot of them. So once I'd done the job of really turning everybody away, I went in to have a look at the thousands of books that church members had brought in and they were selling them the next day. As I went along, I saw books on Mormonism. I saw Jehovah's Witness books. I saw books on the occult. I saw sexual books. I, I saw, like, occult books, you know, Stephen King, The Devil Rides Out. As I went along, expecting to see books from Christian members of the church, I was absolutely horrified by, by what I saw. That the people were going to come into a church and buy books about other faiths and buy books on the alcohol, and buy books on sex and violence. So I thought, obviously, the minister of this other denomination doesn't know this. So I asked where he was, and he was in an office at the back, and I went in, and I explained to him, thinking he'd be oh, horrified, let's go and do it. He said, well, just do whatever you want to do. Tell him, tell him in to take him away or something. And he just, he literally, I was in use, he just didn't care, and I was a wee bit shocked be a new Christian, new age of a year, year of Christian. So I went out to a couple of the elders outside and I explained to them. And I, I, you know, I was passionate about it. Not angry, but passionate about it. And they said, ah, right, okay, well then what we'll do, we'll gather them all up and we'll take them down to the markets tomorrow and sell them there. And you know, I walked outside and I walked around and around that church in the dark because inside me there was a righteous anger that I wanted to run back in there and I wanted to get every one of those tables and I wanted to toss them up, I wanted to wreck the place. And you know something, to this day I wish that I had, but as a young Christian I didn't understand righteous anger. That was a righteous anger. Where, where Jesus went in and made a book of course and chased out people just selling a few dogs and pigeons like merchandising where you can actually buy books of another faith in the house of God and nobody cared you see there's a, a zeal for the house of God that God has, has put within me so there have been times when I have experienced a righteous anger let me give you another example of of, of righteous anger because I want to explain what anger is so that you, you can see it the good, the bad and the ugly very very clearly there was a a lady years ago I heard that she'd taken a stroke and she was in hospital um, and after church I went up to see her and it, 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 uh, introduced myself, she's only about 40, 42 and she's in a really bad way I'd left her really you know, her face and arm and, and distorted and, so I kind of got to know her, not every Sunday after church, just to talk to her. And one day when she was there, her, her, her husband was there. And, uh, and that was the first time that I met him. And when I was there, two of the elders of the church came in and they didn't speak to the man when he was there. And I mean, come long story short, what had actually happened was that her husband... Uh, I won't go into details, but let's say had behaved extremely badly, to put it mildly, uh, and had brought great shame on the church, and was unrepentant about it as well. Uh, and so when I, I heard only that days afterwards, and I was a bit saddened by that, but the lady at this stage had been discharged from, from hospital, but back to a husband who, I can assure you, if I told you the story, you would understand, did not care for his wife. Anyway, after about two months later, um, I used to lead a, a house group, and one of the ladies in the house group was ill, so I called around to, to see her. And when I was talking to her in her house, she said, um, that lady that you used to, to, to call up with on a Sunday night, um, her husband has been beating her up. Um, and continuing on his wicked ways 
And I remember where I was actually sitting, I was having a cup of tea, just having a polite conversation with this lady, when suddenly a righteous anger of the Lord came upon me, and I actually shook. And I, at that moment, in my spirit, I knew that that man was that far off the wrath of God falling upon him. And I couldn't even talk to this lady. I was actually shaking with the wrath of God within me. Anyway, it, it sort of subsided after a couple of minutes, and I'm quite shaken, I get in the car to, to drive home. And just when I was literally 50 metres from my front door, I could see Linda unpacking groceries. She'd just been to Tesco's, and I was just about to drive up and, and pull into the driveway. When the Lord said to me, go and find that man and tell him what I have revealed to you. Well, first of all, that was a shock. But secondly, I said, Lord, I don't know where they live. I've never been to their house. And the Lord said, I will show you. So I put up and Linda says, hi. I said, Linda, have to go, sorry. Reverse the driveway and set off down to the bottom of the road. And I felt in my spirit to turn right, turn left. And eventually I'm way out of the countryside. And I'm thinking, have I lost the plot here? And I'm driving along through these wee lonely roads. And suddenly I found myself stopping at a cottage. And I said, oh Lord, surely not. I thought, this is a nonsense. But I'll go up to the house and I'll just say, can you give me the directions to wherever? But as I walked past the window, there he was sitting inside. I said, dear God, you have directed me to his house. <laughs> and so I knocked on the door and this wife recognised me, she was in a wheelchair and she, she uh, called me in and he never even looked at me, he just sat changing channels on the TV so I didn't know how to broach the subject but eventually anyway, uh, after about half an hour, about four Kit Kats and three coffees <laughs> uh, thinking, what, what do I do Lord, what, what's the next step? Um, the Lord made away because she suddenly said, I have these terrible nightmares at night. And he actually stopped watching the telly. He says, that's right, she really does have horrendous nightmares at night. And the Lord said, pray for her, I'll hear her. So I said, let me pray for you. So I just laid hands on her and she went, oh. And she just swooned over the side of the, the wheelchair. Well, he came from a, a, a denomination that those things didn't happen in. And he looked at me as if, who are you? <laughs> and then... His wife sort of came and she says, oh, this heat that went through me. So he sort of looked at me and said, who are you? And I knew that was the moment I said, could I talk to you please on your own? And he went. <laughs> <laughs> so his wife sort of said, oh, that's okay. And she wheeled herself out. So I said, I'm just the postman. I'm just the postman. But I'm here to tell you this. That the Lord says, you are standing on the edge of his wrath. One more step in that direction and his wrath will fall on you. Do you understand? He said perfectly. I said, well then, my job's done. And I went in and said, I'm away now. Thank you for the lovely day. Never saw him again. But... And nobody else knew about it. And... But months later, I was talking to the lady who had, who, whose house I'd been in when she told me about him bigging her up. And she didn't know it until this day. Doesn't know what, what happened from that meeting. But she said, I don't know what happened to that lady's husband. But, you know... He's never touched her again. He was around thumping walls and thumping the rails, but he's never, ever laid hands on her again. Isn't it interesting? You see, this is, you see, God has righteous anger. And there's nothing wrong with us having God's righteous anger. Not our unrighteous anger, but God's righteous anger. <coughs> I, I could go on telling more and more stories like that because I have seen let me tell you one which, which didn't involve me it was a story that Terry Virgo told but it always stayed with me he said that uh, in his church there was a man who continually committed adultery he had just been found out so many times but he said I can't help it the urge is too strong and his wife had forgiven him again and again but she was pretty broken over the whole thing well Terry Virgo said one day a man with a real gift of prophecy came to the church and he said that this man really just seemed to know what you had for breakfast. He said, but at the end of the first day, he was having lunch or something with Terry Burgo and he said, the Lord has said to me, there's a man in your church continually committing adultery. And I said, that's right. He said, well, I have a word from the Lord for him. 
He said, oh, that's fine, I'll bring you. So he drove him to this man's house, opened the door, a man brought him in, and the man was sitting his arm around his wife, and a cup of tea for them all, and chatting away, chat, 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 chat. And the man said, uh, or Terry Berger said, uh, this man has a word from the Lord for you, and this, this man had been at the church and knew that this man heard from God. So he said, yes, oh, what is it? And the man said, uh, I believe that you continually commit adultery. He said, oh, I do. He said, I, I just can't stop it. I just, it's just, it's just it's a weakness. I just, I'm a, I'm a bloody me way. She forgives me all the time. He said, what's the word? And the guy says, well, the Lord says, if you do it again, he'll kill you. <laughs> Terry Baker says, no, I'll never do it again. Do you understand? So when we talk about the anger of the Lord, it is not the way we think, Mr. Angry, like an angry dad or an angry school teacher, do you understand? It's a righteous anger. It's pure against things that are, are just so blatantly and defiantly and persistently unholy and wrong. But God is so patient, so slow to anger, so, so long-suffering. But there does come a point if we just persist, knowing what's the truth, if we persist and persist and persist and persist, yet all the while claiming to represent God, that there actually comes a time when, when I have no question that the anger of the Lord will, will be revealed. So that's righteous anger. And there is no problem with any of us who love the Lord, who love the kingdom of God having that righteous anger. It's, it's, it's not like an ungodly anger where you want to reach out and slap somebody or poke them in the eye or whatever. It's not that kind of an anger. It's a representing God anger. But there's also other anger which is, which is I would say, good anger. You see, the Bible says, don't be angry. It says, in your anger, do not sin. Be angry, but don't sin. Or as Lisa Bevere's book says, be angry, but don't gloat. Okay. I mean, say for instance, you saw some kids outside torturing a dog or a cat. You know, anger would be a very natural emotion and response which would drive you over to intervene, to actually rescue that. And you wouldn't be going over saying, excuse me, I wonder if you stop torturing that little kid. You know what I'm saying? What are you doing? What are you doing? Get my head, get my head. Do you understand? And then, you know, that would be a good anger. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite sure that a, a lot of the, of the men and other women who had to fight in the trenches, you know, in the Second World War, I'm sure when the stories came back of the, you know, of the death camps, etc., in the latter part of the war, I'm sure whenever the, the rebels, I'm sure there was a, a, a real anger that really brought them into battle to see that, to see that put right. So anger is something that God has put in us, and anger in itself, anger in itself, if it's done right and handled right, is not wrong, okay? But it's a dangerous emotion. And what I'm going to be talking about from now on is ungodly anger. You see, if you have because God has given us the ability to fear, hence don't go near cliffs, etc., etc. But that emotion can be distorted until it becomes an ungodly fear. And so what I'm going to be talking about now is ungodly anger. And if I could say right at the, right the front that ungodly anger is weakness. I'll say it again. Ungodly anger is weakness. There's many reasons why people are angry. There's so many that actually I could do a one-day course on anger. There's so many, but I only just want to dip into a few. First of all, anger can actually give you a sense of control. You can control events by your anger, especially in, in your home. If you're too weak to do it by example, or too impatient to work at it slowly, Simply get in your way by having people frightened of your anger is one way to get it done because people will jump to it. Not because they love you or respect you, but because 
the, your fierce anger, they'll do it just to avoid that. I remember years ago being invited out to the home of a lovely couple for an evening meal. And before the meal, we were just sitting around chatting, waiting for the meal to be ready. The lady of the house, I had always seen as a lovely, quiet, reserved lady, she said, Before you go, Ken, would you pray for my anger? I said, Goodness, I didn't, wouldn't associate you with anger. She said, Oh, yes. She said, I have a fierce anger. And her husband said nervously, Yes, she has a fierce anger. And so, as I got over the, the shock of trying to think of this quiet, gentle woman with this fierce anger, I said, okay, I'll pray for you after dinner. Could everybody switch their phones off? Could everybody just switch their phones off? It really does distract and disturb. They're, they're so useful outside, but they're just not useful in here. Um, so, I said, I will pray for your anger if you're willing to, to give up the, the control that goes with it. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, I bet you your husband and family jump to do what you want when you're angry. She said, yes, they do. And the husband said, yes, we do. <laughs> and I said, well, are you, I will pray for you if you're willing to give up that ungodly control. She said, let me think about that. At the end of the meal, she never ever asked me. Because you see, she wasn't willing to give up the ungodly control. She got things done her way and she got them done fast. Not by example, not by love, and, but simply the shortcut is I will be a bully with anger. And so that had then become a habit of a lifestyle for her. And she wasn't willing to give that up. Anger can come from injustices, especially when we're young. You see, we don't, we haven't as yet done any teaching on a depression and one day we will, but in actual fact, there's things like fear and anger that are repressed can actually produce depression. Because you see, especially when you're young, or maybe if you're in work or, or wherever you're at, and there's injustices done to you, things that just aren't fair, but you can't, you don't have permission to to express that emotion in anger, otherwise it'll, it'll be trouble for you. So you press it all down and you smile and you're calm on the outside because it's the smart thing to do. But those injustices are never properly dealt with and so you press all those injustices, that's not fair, why is it always me? Those are all pressed down somewhere into your soul like coil springs. And so even though there's this gentle, there's a simmering bomb or bombs on the inside. And then sometimes that anger can come out at home in the simplest little things that bear no relation to that. Somebody can drop a glass and break it. It just, you know, if you go through life, you can't get through life without breaking a glass. But maybe somebody breaks a glass. What are you doing that for? You're always in it. Clean that up now. Get rid of that, you stupid person. You stupid. And there's a whole anger thing over something that's small. But in actual fact, the real root, the real root is a simmering anger that's always there through injustices that have always been done to you. <coughs> we'll be looking at, at how, to, how to handle these in a, a moment. Rejection, of course, can produce anger as well. That every time you try to be accepted, for some reason you're rejected, and eventually, the, again, that turns into a real anger an anger against the world, an anger against parents, an anger against school, an anger against authority, an anger against the police, an anger against whatever. And so, this is simmering inside, simmering inside, and it comes out. It comes out in ungodly anger, knee-jerk reactions here, there, and everywhere. And so those outbursts are only symptoms of something that actually has to be dealt with inside. Betrayal is a, is a big cause of it. And you simply can't get through life without being betrayed. And I suspect even you might be able to get through life without actually being a betrayer at, at, at some stage, either a little or a, a lot. But again, if you've been betrayed, if you've trusted somebody and they have 
have betrayed you. There can be a real anger over that. Now, that's a natural anger. But what I'm saying is this. If these things aren't handled properly, and we'll come to that in a moment, then what happens is instead of them having their outworking in a safe place and being vented, they simmer down in here and they start coming out all over the place. <coughs> but you become an angry person. They can be just simply unrelenting pressures, they can be financial pressures that just don't go away, health pressures that just don't go away, and it's just like more weights come on your life and, and eventually just as a measure of coping, you start being angry because it kind of gives you a, a fire in your belly and a strength instead of feeling like you're being bowed down with these. Anger seems to give you like the incredible hulk, a temporary burst of power. You have anger over rights of ownership. You're in my territory. That's my car parking space. You know, that's my garden that your dogs just pooed on. It can be lots of things that that you have boundaries set and you're very rigid about those and you maybe respect other people's boundaries but your boundaries being crossed and you feel threatened by that if I let this go what will be the next thing if I let that go what will be the next thing and you build it up into a whole a perception that your whole life's under threat and so you respond with, with anger arguing with the neighbour over the fence over, over something There can be anger just through frustration over unmet goals. I wanted to marry, I wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to live in a nice house, I wanted to have a happy marriage, I wanted to have a career, I wanted to be slim, whatever. And somehow you have these unmet goals, and instead of handling them right, you start becoming angry in general, because you're just angry with the way that your life seems to be turning out. And instead of being a person at peace and rest with yourself, you're just a turbulent personality. A prickly, a prickly personality like a nettle. You can be angry because there's been hurtful words. You know, my, you're putting on the beef, aren't you? You know, just a passing statement or something that can actually just be a real fiery dart. And again, if these things aren't handled right, they can actually turn into really... Start off with a slow anger, boil up a little bit more until the anger boils up until you're a pot ready to explode. There can be anger through impatience. Shouldn't my husband have mended that fence by now? Will my boss ever notice me? That's the third time I've written to the NIE and the, you know, I've been hanging on this phone here, I've heard green sleeves ten times, I've pressed button one, button three, button four, and back to button one again. You know, and now these people don't even speak English when I get there. I've had enough of it! You know, you know, and... Oh, by the way, would you like to go to church on Sunday? <laughs> Anger can be from a, a perceived slight or offence. Just reading the paper this, uh, <coughs> this morning where two motorists coming out of a junction, both trying to edge into a space, and it ended up they started shouting, honking the horn at each other, then shouting each other, then they pulled in, and a punch up started, and one of them killed the other one. You see, this thing about respect, I must have respect, I must have respect. So many young lads are knifing other lads because they, they looked at me wrongly, they didn't show me respect. And so if you won't show me respect, you'll get my response in anger. And you see, anger is very closely linked to malice, which is very closely linked to rage. Anger, malice, and rage. So anger can quickly become road rage. You can get husbands who just don't know how to run a household properly and think that if anything goes wrong, it's a lack of respect for them. I'm the head of this house, and because everything's not perfectly under my control, I don't get the respect I want, and so the response is anger. I will make it come into shape through anger. I will so dominate and control this household through my anger that they will come into alignment the way I want that household into alignment. As Napoleon said, what I take by the sword, I have to hold by the sword. And so if your household is held in the place by anger, you've got to hold it in place by anger. 
It's weakness. It's just weakness. There can be anger through jealousy. Why does my sister get this or why does the girl next to me or the man next to me at work get all the attention and just how, how come how come you know he can change his car every two years and I mean is he a drug dealer or something? What's he you know you know and, and so little scenes of little scenes of Jealousy can quickly turn into, then you start having thoughts that become, you start putting on glasses, then you start becoming angry. He really annoys me next door, you know. See why he keeps his garden so neat and tidy, like who does he think he is? And then it slowly works up to real anger and real rage. And by the way, you like to go to church on Sunday. Would you like to be a Christian like me? Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And the the Hebrew is that it's like a demon is crouching at the door. So just be careful of your behavior. Sin lies at the door and it's desirous for you, but you should read over it. You see, one of the things about being a Christian and having Christ in us is that we should have godly self-control. Not that something controls us, but that we have godly self-control. You see, you can't stop things that make you angry. You just can't. You can't stop things that actually try to frighten you. You just can't do it. You can't stop things that, that, that actually come to want to reject you. They just come until you go to heaven. It's going to come. But we are called as Christians, Christ in us, to actually exercise godly self-control. I'll come back and again towards the end as how we do this. A lot of anger can actually come through fear. People just have a fear of poverty, a, a fear of their being put out of their house, a, a fear of the children dying, a, a fear of whatever. And just the way I talked about confronting these fears, taking ownership last week and confronting them in Jesus' name rather than bowing the knee to them. But if fears get into you, eventually your own response at the pain of the sheer fear that's got into your belly that you can start to be angry with people and so they're getting the brunt of your action because secretly inside you're actually maybe a fear of poverty or a fear of this but you won't own that fear you won't bring it up to the light and say the real I'm disturbed because I have a, such a fear of poverty or I have such a fear of cancer I have such a fear it gnaws away up instead of bringing that out as the real culprit and dealing with it it actually stays locked away but the pain produces an anger out which just a short fuse all the time. People say, my goodness, I can't live with her. My goodness, you have to walk in eggshells past her. You have to walk in eggshells past her. You say the wrong thing. It's like a mind going off. They're just bristling. But often, it's not the eggshells. It's a lot of fear that's inside. But it hasn't been owned, identified, and dealt with. And so people get the symptoms of that weed in their face all the time. It can be anger that comes through a, a poor self-image. Why am I overweight? Why am I so stupid? Why am I so untidy? Why am I so undisciplined? Why am I so miserable? Why am I so lonely? Why am I so boring? All these negative views of yourself. You see, everybody else is nearly having it sus, but you don't. And so, just anger creeps in. Just a general anger at life you thought I wish I was this height this shape I wish I looked like whoever do you know something it doesn't make a bottom difference one of the most angry people is in Naomi Cal <coughs> I mean she's I mean she's about to it, it looks like she'll be going to jail again because when one of her bags wasn't loaded on the on the airplanes and all the papers that she picked up such a ride in first class 
swore it all the stuff, and some of the girls crying, assaulted some of the males, and the police came, she assaulted them as well. And she's renowned for her ferocious anger, and yet she's got the looks, she's got the fame, she's got the money, it doesn't make a pop of difference. It's got nothing to do with that at all. Unless you, as a Christian, deal with these things properly in Jesus Christ, you will not be free of it. It can be the generation, it can be past failures, where just, instead of just getting up, dusting yourself down and going on for another go, you just keep looking back at a failed at my marriage, a failed at this, the kids didn't talk about, I've never had a good job, and you just look back and you just stop failure. And you feel as if everybody else sees the word failure there. And so you're sort of just inherently angry with just the way everything has turned out. And so you become prickly. You become a short fuse. Uh, there's a, a bulb gas, you know, the wee short readings. And there's one I remember, I cut it out, I have it somewhere in some file. But I love this. It said there was a man born in whatever state in America. And he failed at this, and then his business failed, and then that failed, and then this failed, and that failed. And then he stood for, for government, and he failed, he stood again, and he failed, he stood again, and he failed, and he did something else, and he failed. And you thought, my goodness, this man's some failure. And then he said, and then he, he stood again, and got elected, and his name was Abraham Lincoln. Do you know what I mean? I just... My daughter got quite emotional today. She was reading a copy of the Reader's Digest and she came in and says, Dad, I've just read this story about a Mexican man. He was born from a, a really, really poor family and he, he kind of crossed over illegally into America, was caught, put back again, crossed over illegally, put back, crossed over, next time wasn't caught, uh, worked plucking tomatoes for a really, for a really nasty man. But he carried a wee English book in here and he was picking the tomatoes, he was trying to learn English. And today he's one of the top brain surgeons in America. You see, failure is something you can say, I'm a failure. It's up to you, whatever attitude. If you say you're a failure, yeah, you are. Because what you believe you are is exactly what you lacked out. But don't ask God to agree with you. Because he won't. You'll be on your own in that one. Anger can be an inheritance thing. Your father was angry. His father was angry. His father was angry. And so you just inherited that. It just seems it's always been in your personality. Well that's one of those cases that we taught them generational stuff away about the first or second Friday night here. You really have to go before God and just honour your ancestors, but just say, Lord, I don't agree with that anger. And I just transfer that now to the Lamb of God at the cross, and under the divine exchange, I take my freedom, and the Lamb of God takes all that, all that ungodly wrath. And I receive that by faith and I walk on now without it. I leave it at the cross and walk on. It can be demonic. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, don't let the sun go down in your anger. Don't give the devil a foothold. <coughs> so Guess what? If you do, if you don't deal with your anger and you let it simmer on, do you know what you do? Then you do give the devil a foothold. Now, at this stage, a foothold isn't a stronghold. It's like the old, I always liken it to the old salesman, the young people wouldn't I remember these, but they used to be salesmen that went around door to door with a suitcase selling stuff. And they would knock on your door. You remember it when you built it? Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. My dad told me about it. But it was, it was, he used to come around with a, a suitcase selling kitchen stuff and stuff for the house. And if they rang the door and the housewife opened the door, they used to put a foot in the door. Because while one foot was in the door, they couldn't close the door. And the housewife would be too embarrassed to. But, so that was only a foothold. But then if he actually got to the stage where he actually could get both feet in 
And actually, into the hallway, he now had a stronghold, he was much harder to get out. And if he actually got in to demonstrate his wares inside, then he, he would get a sale, because that was the only way that you were going to get him out. Okay? So, don't let the sun go down your anger, don't give the devil a foothold. So, a foothold is just the beginning of a grip. But you see, if it's not dealt with, eventually it becomes a stronghold in your life. And you start being angry all the time. Let me give you an example of how real that is. I find it at the beginning when I was a young Christian, God was very gracious with me, very long-suffering, patient. <laughs> and I could make mistakes many, many times, and he was very, very patient. But I find that as I got to know these things, and they were part of me, then if I deliberately broke them, he just wasn't as patient, does that make sense? So, let me give you an example. I, this is a verse that God has always put in me. Ken, don't let the sun go down your anger. So, if Linda and I have a little bit of an argument, it's always your fault, but, but if we have a little bit of an argument, you know, I've always been careful before we, before we go to sleep. And that verse just comes up and sits there saying, Ken, don't let the sun go down your anger. Don't give the devil a foothold. He's prowling around looking for something to bar. Don't give him ground. So, I'll go, I'm sorry. <laughs> Me too. And then, but then that kind of broken and uh, so a very healthy housekeeping habit. But about a year or so ago, we had had a, a disagreement. But it was about ten o'clock at night. So I was still sort of, and so I knew when I went to bed, and I could see this verse sitting there. I really could, and I knew it had to be. But I just, for once, I didn't do it. I just said no. I've only had two hours of seating and that's not long enough. <laughs> I thought I'll do it in the morning, tomorrow. Do you know something? I went downstairs and I went to the kitchen and I tried to, to put it right and I couldn't do it. I said I'll do it in the afternoon. Go right in the afternoon and I couldn't do it. I thought I'll do it before I go to bed tonight and I couldn't do it. Second day was the same. Third day I thought, Lord, what is happening? Why I, I walked in so many times just to say, Look, I'm sorry, this and I just couldn't do it. And suddenly I felt the Lord say, Ken, you knew what you should, you knew what you had to do, but you deliberately turned your back. You deliberately chose your own way. And I said, Lord, I did. And I'd get down on my knees and repent of that. Genuinely. And a minute later I was able to walk in and do it like that. It really God really showed me the reality of this that if you don't exercise authority over your anger, the devil who's praying, he will, not might, he will get a foothold. And it's not devil, he will build a stronghold in your life or in your family's life until everything's dealt with by anger. He's got a grip and nobody wants it any longer. Nobody wants the anger any longer, but it's just there. Just everything's handled by conflict. Put that television off. You know, what's that light doing? What is that light doing on? Okay, who didn't do the dishes? Who turn was it tonight? And just everything's done by conflict. And you think to yourself, I don't want it to be like this. Oh, please God, I don't want it to be like this. But somehow anger has got a grip in our household. But you know something? The only way out of it is repentance. To humble yourself before God and say, God, you know what? I, stroke we, have given the devil a foothold and a stronghold into our lives and into this family. Lord, we take full responsibility. We've given him a right. He's just simply come in and agreed with us. There's a spirit of anger in this thing. Spirit of anger in my life too, Lord. I give it rights and you know what? I'm taking those rights away. I'm truly, truly, truly sorry. I'm truly sorry, Lord. So anger can be explosions of anger an attack or lash out verbally or physically. It can be a simmering anger where, where you don't talk to somebody for a week or so. That's how you handle your anger. You just turn your back and the silence is your anger. It can be denial or burial, calm on the outside, but boiling inside. Or there could be the anger called revenge. What's well, fine, yes, no problem at all. Uh, don't worry, no worry. Just you wait and see. <laughs> and so it's a cold anger. It's not a burning, it's a cold anger. You know, revenge is best served cold. Just you wait. Okay. 
Then there's the martyr. Where their anger is long, loud, and long suffering. I'm fed up with this, you always do that. Oh dear, dear, why don't you go somewhere else? And, oh, just, and just day after day, just, oh, just, I'm a martyr, poor me. What a life I have to lead. Nobody appreciates me. I do all the work, oh, that's here, just nobody helps me. I'm a martyr. That's just a form of anger and frustration, and it just comes out in an ungodly way. Then it can be turned inward. Instead of having an expression, it can be turned inward, and then it becomes depression. Because depression is when you depress something. You know when you depress a pedal? You depress the accelerator pedal. Depression is when anger or frustration or fear is actually pressed down. And you think because it's pressed down, it's gone away. It hasn't. It hasn't. And until it's brought into the light and proper words put on it and brought before God and owned then and only then will you be free from it. So it can be self-harming, cutting flesh in unseen places. We've worked with so many people, so many people who've got an anger, usually against themselves, usually, um, usually against themselves. And so they start to self-harm. I know uh, one man was self-harming because he was so angry because something very bad had been done to him and the person the person got away with it. Well, in fact, I'll tell you who it was because he would be quite happy. Simon, who was a member of, who was a member of our team, Simon Rowland. And it's part of his testimony that he was nearly, he was in the Navy, he was nearly kicked to death by an instructor, left for dead. And anyway, after he survived, after being in a coma for 20 days, and uh, he was brain damaged and he was in hospital for a year then discharged out of the Navy and sent home really to be a, a, a brain damaged wreck for the rest of his life and anyway there was times whenever uh, and the man who did it got off went to court and the man got off because it was previous good record so can you imagine the anger and the, as an unsafe person he, this is before Simon was saved can you imagine the anger that he, he would have been a a naval commander by now, and here he was, bricks, brain damage for life, not able to talk right, not able to hold a job down, and the man who did it actually got off scot free with just a wee bit of a slap on the back of the hand. Can you imagine? Well, he was, in his testimony, he says he was so angry that he was frightened for people all around him, so he took the anger out on himself. He turned it inward for safety purposes. But then God came along and saved him and healed him. And for years now, he's been one of our best prayer prayer ministers. We've been a gentler, a gentler soul than you can imagine. Okay, how do we handle anger in the future? <coughs> As I said, Ephesians four twenty six: Be angry and do not sin. And Psalm four four says the same thing: Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. And that verse, be still and know that I'm God, isn't just a nice wee verse. God didn't put that so that people could put it in plaques and put it in their wall. He actually meant it as a, a, as a liberty instruction to be still. So when events are starting to pile up and you start to get, you can feel those emotions beginning to come up. You know what the Lord says? Just take your eyes off that. Just be still and remember that I'm God. And so the technique that, that I use when I find things or I find stories coming in that really have the potential to upset me and annoy me and I can feel those emotions starting to bubble. I can feel... Uh, and a lot of it usually happens just before I go to, to, to actually teach on the day I go to teach. Maybe not a surprise. And what I always do, I just quietly, I go very silent. If I'm driving the car or whatever, I go silent. Because I go still inside and I just fix my, the eyes of my spirit in Jesus. And I say, Jesus, Jesus, I give this to you. And in my spirit I say, Lord, this is the issue which you know. But let me just speak my spirit. This is really having a bad effect. I just want to give this to you, Lord. Just put it safely into your hands. You know, after about a minute, it's gone. See, Jesus said, cast your cares upon me because I care for you. And whether the cares are frustration, rejection, fears, whatever it is, that's a care and it weighs. Let me, let me, let me find a, 
let me find something. There's never something when you want it. I'm looking for something. Has anybody got a, a, a book? Uh, here we go, here we go. Yeah, this will do, yeah. Here's a care. I can I ask you to stand for a moment? So I take you to sit in front. Okay, there's a care. Just look, if, you, if you just hold that care, okay, and just, just sit down with it, okay? Okay, so that's your care. You can put on it whatever it is, whatever has really frustrated you, annoyed you, upset you, has the potential to ruin your day, ruin your week, ruin your whole Christian disposition, and you can hang on to it if you want. It's yours. Put your name on it, the events surrounded you, and you can go off and have a cup of tea with it later, and you can whatever. It's yours. But you know something, after... After an hour or two, the novelty will, will wear off. But you know what Jesus says? <coughs> Cast your care on me, and I care for you. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean that the events have changed. You know what it means? That you've actually put it into the hands of the one who loves you. Okay? It doesn't mean events have changed. What it means is now that heavy yoke is off your shoulder. Okay? And Jesus' yoke, which is very light, is now on your shoulder. It doesn't mean they go away, but it actually means that somebody else who's much more able and stronger is actually carrying you. You see, that's why Paul says in Philippians 4, 6, don't be anxious about anything. Everything with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And then the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and will guard your mind in Christ Jesus. Now, God did not put that in Scripture just to have a nice wee verse on a plaque in faith mission. That was not God's purpose of putting it there. When God puts something in Scripture, it's because He means it, and if you do it, He will play His part. Okay? If you do your part, guaranteed He'll do His part. If you don't do your part, He's under no obligation to do His part. If you want to hold on to your anxiety, then He's not going to wrench it out of your hands. Okay? And you see, because anger starts with whatever form of anxiety, a frustration, sense of failure, whatever it is I got there, but Paul says, don't, and when God says do not, do you know what he means? He means do not. That's very theological. Do not be anxious about anything. Do you know what anything means? Yeah, anything. But in everything, do you know what everything means? That covers everything. So there's no escape from this. There's no, ah, Lord, but you don't, ah. It covers everything. No excuses. Don't be anxious about anything. In everything. With prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. In other words, not just and there you go Lord but just actually coming before God in a reverential way Heavenly Father Lord the events this week in my house and my work Lord oh dear they have disturbed me Lord I'm just so disturbed over Lord I just I'm so angry with what was said to me Lord I just oh my head's hurting with the anger Lord and you're beginning to pour it out to God <coughs> you're putting words to it Lord I can Rain of frustration. Lord, the pain of that rejection. Oh God, why, dear God, that's the third time this week. And so it's not been allowed to be pressed down and hidden. It's not been taken out to somebody else. It's actually been given to God. Say, Lord, too big for me to handle. I'm going to do what you said to do. Lord, I give you this anxiety. I pass it over to you. It doesn't belong to me anymore. From now on, I'm going to take your rest. And God says when you do that, you know what? And then the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And sometimes the event is so bad that you've got to do it three times in an hour. Sometimes it's so awful that you've got to do it six times in a day. But you know what happens? After a while, when you get into that new habit of life, lifestyle, you can actually do it once and it's done. When you've never done it before, the first time you always have no faith that God will take it. Well, it sounds good, but I can't. I mean, God's busy. Would God really take this? So you sort of said, almost no faith, a mustard seed. 
But actually, if you stay there, you will find that God is faithful, that God watches over His word. Why would He put it in if He didn't watch over it? Why would He put it in and then you bring it to Him in, in just reverence? Why would He say, actually, it didn't mean you? Or I'm too busy with Iraq and Afghanistan to come back tomorrow. Do you understand? So please get that into your hearts. Let's look at a few other scriptures. Scriptures, Scripture tells us that anger, and I'm talking ungodly anger, not dealt with, will actually harm us. Cease, Psalm 37, verse 8, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. I don't know of anybody who can say ungodly anger every, ever brought good fruit in a life, in a family, in a nation, or a, a world. That's why top politicians, you never see them, you know, they're always considered in their response. I mean, we, we sort of mock them, which we, which we shouldn't do. That actually, it, it, it's very, you know, it might be what the press and the TV <coughs> likes, but actually, like, it's not what us Christians, we are actually not called to actually join in the mocking of leaders. We can have a view about it, we can have a reasoned view, but when we start mocking them, then it's actually ungodly. Uh, John Bevere teaches brilliant in this on honour where honour is due. But you never see, you never saw a, a Tony Blair or Ronald Reagan or George Bush like having a, what do you say? Ah! No, they're always, these are people who have a control over their emotions. They can get these things in and they can exercise a control and so they can handle responsibility. But you see, when you don't have it, it starts to cause you harm. It, it can actually give you an ulcer and it can start to burn within you so much it can start to actually even physically, emotionally, you'll be tired all the time with so much anger inside you. You'll actually just be tired all the time. There, there is nothing good you can say about ungodly anger except that for a moment it makes you feel powerful. Scripture says it is foolish to be continually angry. Proverbs 12:16. A fool's anger is known at once, but a prudent man covers shame. Proverbs 14, 29. He who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is impulsive, like just knee-jerk reaction, exalts folly or stupidity. Proverbs 15, 18. An angry man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger allays contention. And Scripture says that though that the wise person has godly control over their anger rather than their anger having ungodly control over them. Proverbs 16.32 He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he who rules his spirit better than he who takes a city. The Psalms, I, I love the Psalms because, you know, probably the majority of them by, by written by King David. I've never worked out the number, but I, I suspect probably the majority written by King David. And King David really knew how to bring all his emotions before, but that's what I, I like about the Psalm. When David was up and happy, the Psalms said that. When he was worried and troubled and frightened, that's what the Psalms got. And when he was angry, he would bring that anger to a safe place before the Lord. But eventually, when he had vented his anger, you would see as that anger went him starting to say, Oh, Lord, hey, have a look at me. Let me read you an example of that. This is, this is David. Here he is, first of all. He's frightened. And that fear is turned into anger. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not know those who rise up against you? Oh, I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. And now these vented all that. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. See if there's any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. And so that's the way as you come before God and you, you have your vent, because it's a safe place to vent. You're not hurting anybody. God can take it. And then when you've poured it all out, suddenly there's a peace comes in, and suddenly you start thinking, actually, 
Maybe I had a wee part to play in it myself. <laughs> Maybe I'm not that innocent in this. But, you know, Lord, thank God, would you just convict me? Would you just...